introduced Brother Francis Crowley. Brother Francis took his BA from Providence College, his MAT from Brown, and his PhD from Providence in Chemistry. He's presently teaching three sections of physics in the school and is the Dean of Spiritual Life. And he has most heroically come today on his walker after a recent back surgery, so we're grateful to him for that. Thank you very much, Brother Francis.
His numerous awards include the 2005 Presidential Citation of the American Institute of Biological Sciences for his distinguished contributions in the field. The 2006 Public, Ser Public Service Award from the American Society for Cell Biology and the 2008 Distinguished Service Award for the National Association of Biology Teachers. In 2009, he received the AAAS Award for Public Understanding of Science and Technology. And in 2009, he also received the Gregor Mendel Medal from Villanova University. In 2010, he received an honorary doctorate from Mount Aloysius College. In 2011, he was recognized with the Stephen J. Gould Prize from the Society for the Evolution for the Study of Evolution. <laughs> Professor Miller. Brother Francis, I'd like to thank you for that, that overly generous introduction. Uh, I'd like to thank all of you for being here today, and I'd especially like to thank Portsmouth Abbey and the organizers of this conference for giving me the honor to take part in the discussions that are going on here this weekend. Um, I, find it, I found it exceptionally easy to accept the invitation to come here because I live exactly 10 miles from here. Uh, and from my point of view, any time that you can attend a conference like this and not get on a plane, that's a good invitation. So once again, thank you all very much for this. Um, uh, you never know how you're going to be introduced, so I always like to bring my own introductory slides along so I can correct distortions or exaggerations. There weren't too many in that, but I am indeed a cell biologist. I work at Brown University. My main research tool is the electron microscope, and I have published in journals like Cell and the Journal of Cell Biology, and I'm currently a co-editor of a journal called Cell Biology and Life Sciences Education. That's sort of my first job. Um, I'm also a teacher. In the spring, I teach the largest science course at my university, an introductory biology course. I won't tell you the actual enrollment of the course, but I'll put it this way. In this past spring, I had a staff of 21 teaching assistants. So that gives you an idea of the size of the course, and also, in a sense, its popularity. My third job, in a sense, has over the years has been that of author. And you might wonder um, how a cell biologist gets interested in evolution. There actually are a lot of answers to that question. But one of those answers is the fact that a number of years ago, a former student of mine, Joe Levine, talked me into doing something absolutely crazy. And that was writing an introductory high school biology textbook. I had no idea how this would turn out. Um, what happened was that book, and that's our latest edition right there, that book turned in many respects into a nationwide bestseller. It's used literally all over the country in all 50 states and several, several, uh, several foreign countries. And how does that get you interested in evolution? Well, the answer is very simple. Our book has as thorough a treatment of evolutionary theory as the central organizing principle of biology as you'll find in any book. And as a result, our book has in various places been attacked, uh, had, had pages glued together so that students could read the evolution sections, and in several states had warning labels placed on the book, very much like those warning labels on a pack of cigarettes, saying evolution is just a theory, be very skeptical about it, and so forth. The other thing that is interesting, and you might wonder if the author of a textbook ever knows the effect that this book has on students. Well, I've been blessed with two daughters. My oldest daughter, Lauren, managed to graduate from Dighton Rehoboth Regional High School, that's the town in which we live in Massachusetts, before my first book was published. My younger daughter, Tracy, not so lucky. Tracy had to suffer the indignity of using her old man's textbook for her first year of biology at our local high school. And you might think that's a good thing, and it kind of is, to have you know, your own high school use your own book. But I have to tell you, the town in which I live, Rehoboth, Massachusetts, uh, it's very small, it's about 8,000 people. And for years, a lot of people in the town knew who I was. But it wasn't because of what I did for a living, it's because for about 10 years, I was kind of like the commissioner of the girls' softball program. I would run the spaghetti suppers to raise money, I used to train our umpires. In the summer, I coached one of our all-star teams, so they all kind of knew Mr. Miller as the softball guy. But they really didn't know what my profession was. Then one day, the high school adopts the book, you can barely see it now, that has an elephant on the cover right there. 
my name was on the cover, my picture is inside my cover is blown. And again, you might think that's a good thing. About a month into that school year, I'm driving up to the high school to pick Tracy up after field hockey practice, and as I pull in the driveway, there's a woman I know through softball, another coach named Bonnie Kelly. And Bonnie saw my little pickup truck, she gets very excited, she flags me down, and I roll the window down and she yells into the window, Ken, Ken, you wrote the book that they're using in the high school now. And you, how would you react to it? I puffed out my chest, I smiled, I said, yes, Bonnie, I did. And then she looked me straight in the eye and said, funny thing is you don't seem that smart. <laughs> And as you heard from that introduction, I've also written two popular books on evolution, one of which is called Finding Darwin's God. I find the subtitle of that, I think, more significant. That is a scientist's search for common ground between God and evolution. And that's a little bit of what I'm going to talk about today, and more recently, the book Only a Theory, Evolution in the Battle for America's Soul. Now, I don't think I have to tell most of the people in this room that evolution is really an issue that divides Americans, and there are a lot of ways to catalyze that. If you want to go to the local library, you can pick up the cover story from Time Magazine, summer 2005, entitled The Evolution Wars. And this is a remarkable issue because they devoted a lot of pages to it. They pointed out that in many polls, most Americans actually reject the theory of evolution. They pointed out that our president at the time, George W. Bush, had actually cast some doubt on evolution. You can see President Bush's face right there. But look very closely at that picture. My co-author called me up very excited when this magazine came out and said, look whose textbook they superimposed President Bush's face on. And lo and behold, that is our textbook. And quite frankly, I was very excited by that because after all, we are always looking for new cover art for our book. <laughs> When the state of Texas adopts new textbooks in a couple of years, you never know, maybe that'll happen. But to illustrate this point, I found myself in the space of 11 months, less than a year, testifying in federal court on two trials on the teaching of evolution, one of them in the state of Georgia and one in the state of Pennsylvania. I'm going to tell you about the Pennsylvania case in just a bit. Less than a year later, evolution was the issue in two statewide elections for state boards of education. And those states were Ohio and Kansas. And you might wonder, especially if you live in a state that doesn't elect the State Board of Education, what does a campaign like that sound like when candidates are basically running for or against the theory of evolution? So here is the front page of the largest newspaper in Ohio about 10 days before the 06 election. Normally low profile contest in spotlight, evolution debate at the center of the state school board race and what they were highlighting was the contest for one of the seats on the board. The incumbent and the leader of anti-evolution forces on the board is this woman, Deborah Owens Fink. She's actually a marketing professor at Akron State University. And her opponent, you can't make this stuff up, folks, was this gentleman right here. His name is Tom Sawyer. But here's what a talk show host in Cleveland told his listeners was at stake in this contest. He said, if you believe in God, creation, and true science, vote for Debbie. If you believe in evolution, abortion, and sin, vote for her opponent. <laughs> and you might wonder, with rhetoric like that, how did poor Mr. Sawyer even stand a chance? And I'm not sure how I would analyze this, but I would tell you that the sin vote turned out to be decisive in Ohio, <laughs> because it turns out the pro-evolution candidates swept the school board elections that year in Ohio, and they also took control of the Kansas Board of Education as well, and that control has been solidified in recent elections in the state of Kansas as well. Um, and what I tell my friends in the educational and science community is never give up on democracy. I believe, quite honestly, the American people, if those of us in science and education come out of the classroom, climb down from the ivory tower in the laboratory, and get out there and explain the case for science to Americans, they will choose it every time, and they will choose it in any state. Now, one of the things I do want to talk about is the so-called Kitzmiller versus Dover trial. In 2004, in this small town in Pennsylvania, the school board voted to um, uh, instruct the teachers to prepare a curriculum on something called intelligent design, presented as an alternative 
to the Darwinian theory of evolution. What happened almost immediately is the science department of Dover High School refused to do it. This is a small high school. That's the science department. Um, and at the risk of losing their jobs, what they told their school board in public meetings was that this stuff was not science. And even when the school board wrote its own four paragraph lesson on intelligent design and purchased intelligent design textbooks for the school library, once again, the teachers refused to have anything to do with it. So what the school board was reduced to doing was instructing the superintendent, the assistant superintendent, to go into every biology classroom on one day and read this four paragraph statement on intelligent design to the students while the teachers literally stood outside in the hallway. What happened a few days later is that 11 parents went down to federal district court in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania and filed a First Amendment lawsuit objecting to the board's policy. That lawsuit has 11 plaintiffs, all of them parents. The first named plaintiff is this unassuming woman over here in the blue blouse, Tammy, uh, Tammy Kitzmiller. So this lawsuit is known as Kitzmiller versus Dover. And what they alleged was that intelligent design was inherently religious and therefore having it inserted in the curriculum by an agency of government violated the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment to the United States Constitution. Now, as this trial moved, and I have to tell you, especially those of you with legal backgrounds, this case went to trial really quickly. The lawsuit was filed in December. The trial started in September the following year. That is really fast. And in the run-up to the trial, many proponents of ID were very excited. And the reason for that is they fantasized a bit about getting Darwinists in court and cross-examining them and breaking them down under oath. They also were excited to have a local school board on their side, and also, by the luck of the draw, and that's how it works in federal court, they had picked a conservative judge, a lifelong Republican named John Jones, who had been appointed to the bench three years earlier by President George W. Bush, and already had a reputation as a strict constitutional constructionist. Now, this discussion of the trial got, came out to be very interesting. And the reason I mention this in part is because the gentleman up here, Bill Demsky, is going to follow me this morning, and you can certainly hear this from him. Um, about uh, in May of 2005, trial started in September, on his blog, he published a strategy for basically cross-examining the Darwinists, the vice strategy, squeezing the truth out of Darwinists. And what Bill wrote in here is, I await the day when the hearings about evolution aren't voluntary, but involve subpoenas that compel evolutionists to be deposed and interrogated in, uh, at length on their views. This is May 11th. May 25th, 14 days later, I was subpoenaed and I was interrogated at length on my views. In fact, my deposition went on for nine and a half hours. It runs to 385 transcript pages. And if any of you have problems with insomnia, email me. <laughs> I will mail you the transcript and you can go ahead and read it. It works full, in a foolproof way. He then said there are ways for this to happen and the wheels are in motion. And indeed that's true because Dr. Dembski was scheduled to be deposed just a few days after me. What I propose is a strategy for interrogating the Darwinists to, as it were, squeeze the truth out of them. And Bill made this even a visual metaphor and on his blog site he published pictures of a little Charlie Darwin doll with its head in a vice being squeezed. So that was an interesting situation, and I realized when I read this blog that we were really headed for an epic confrontation in this trial. To defend the Board of Education, these eight scientists filed as expert witnesses for the defending the school board. You can see them up here, and one of them, of course, was Bill Dembski. And when you file as an expert witness for a federal trial, you just don't show up and say, hi, I'm an expert. You have to write something called an expert statement that says what you're an expert in, how you became an expert, what your credentials are, and kind of what your testimony is likely to be in the matter before the court. You then have to furnish that statement to the other side, and they get to depose you with the court's denominator before the trial even starts. So it's a very rigorous process of sounding out the other side. But a funny thing happened the day after my deposition. And that is our attorneys flew to, uh, to depose first Dr. Dembski and later on Dr. Stephen Meyer, both affiliated with the Discovery Institute. But then suddenly, five of those eight expert witnesses precipitously withdrew from the case. 
And I found this particularly surprising, especially since all of them have filed their expert statement, and Dr. Dembski had actually gone so far as to file a rebuttal expert statement, and yet, for whatever reason, he withdrew before being deposed. Uh, what did that lead to? Uh, what happened over the course of the trial? And the trial lasted for seven weeks, is that intelligent design, quite frankly, collapsed as anything even remotely resembling a scientific theory. And we, you know, you're never sure how a judge is going to rule in a constitutional case. But I have to tell you something that happened on the last day of the trial. If you watch trials on TV, you know that both attorneys, plaintiffs and defendants, get to make a closing summation in front of the judge. When the attorney for the school board got up in front of the judge, he had one of those little calendar day miners, and he fumbled through it for a little bit. Nobody knew what he was doing. And then he looked up at the bench and said, Your Honor, I'm not sure if the court is aware of this, but this trial has gone on for 40 days and 40 nights. <laughs> and then the judge leaned down from the bench and said, but it wasn't by design. <laughs> At that point, we kind of had an idea what was going to happen. Um, all of this, for those who have not seen it, was recorded in a two-hour NOVA program called Judgment Day. And this clip will give you an idea as to how this case divided this small town. I believe there is an intelligent design in the beginning. God created it. Saying that you don't believe in evolution is almost saying we don't believe that the Civil War ever took place in the United States. An extraordinary court case ignites a small town. It's like a civil war within the community, there's no question. And puts science itself on trial. Very important things were at stake. One is the future of science education in this country. Nova reveals the story behind the headlines. Anywhere you turn, we were getting attacked. Witnesses uh, started dropping like flies. And probes the question, is intelligent design a scientific alternative to evolution? Properly the subject of science class. Or religion in disguise. It's a violation of everything we need and everything we understand by science. Judgment Day, Intelligent Design on Trial, on NOVA. Now, I hope that narration was dramatic enough for you. <laughs> they call that the end of the world narration style. <laughs> and th this extraordinary program won the Peabody Award for broadcast journalism, which is sort of the journalistic equivalent of the Oscar. It was a remarkable program. You can still watch it on streaming video free to the NOVA website. Um, and I know from correspondence with high school teachers, lots of them show this to their high school students so they can understand what the controversies about teaching evolution have been all about. Um, I was the lead witness for the plaintiffs in that trial. Uh, I was joined by a wonderful cast of other expert witnesses. And the one I particularly want to take pains to mention is John Hoyt, um, who spoke to this group last night. And it's significant for those people who thought that this was a case of science against religion. It's significant, of course, that Jack and I are both practicing Catholics. Of the 11 plaintiffs, <clears throat> eight of them are, in fact, people of faith. Two of them teach Sunday school, and one actually runs a summer Bible camp. And these were the plaintiffs objecting to the intelligent design policy. And I've had to repeat this to people over and over again. I also got a, a slew of email after my testimony saying, who are you? to tell people in Pennsylvania what they can or cannot teach their children. And my answer to that in all cases was, I'm nobody and I'm not there to tell people, don't forget, I didn't file the lawsuit. The ACLU didn't file the lawsuit. The parents of children in the school filed the lawsuit and they asked me to testify. And that's an important point to make. Well, the decision was announced just before Christmas on 2005 and it was a ringing decision. Judge Jones, that Republican appointee, announced that intelligent design simply is not science and it cannot untangle itself from its creationist roots. Those are his words. Um, this was front page news in newspapers everywhere from the New York Times to USA Today. It led on the nightly news for most of the networks that evening and it set off rejoicing among the parents who after all were the plaintiffs in the Dover case. So what I'd like to pretend today is that the advocates of intelligent design had their day in court. In fact, they had their three weeks in court because that's how long they took to present the case. They contradicted themselves. They literally fell on their face. Therefore, it's over, and we can simply go back to doing and teaching science. But the reason I wrote that more recent book is 
because of three realizations. One is this battle isn't over. The second thing is, and this may surprise you, it's actually not about evolution. It's actually a battle about the place of scientific rationality itself. What is the point of, of scientific reason? And finally, I think it matters, it really matters for the future of this country. Now last night you heard Jack introduce this gentleman, Philip Johnson, as sort of the founder and the intellectual guiding light of the intelligent design movement. And I would agree with that. Phil is a retired professor of criminal law at the University of California at Berkeley. Um, here's what he said in an interview right after the conclusion of the trial. And boy, is this significant. He said, I don't think there really is an intent, a theory of intelligent design right now that we can propose as an alternative to the Darwinian theory. Now, he's not saying that evolution is right. Believe me, he's not. But what he is saying is that we don't have a comparable theory. He then says there's no intelligent design theory that's comparable. No product is ready for competition in the educational world. So what I tell school teachers who are confronted with the demand to teach intelligent design is don't listen to me, listen to Philip Johnson. And Philip Johnson has said that there is no theory of intelligent design that is ready to go into the classroom, and he is the country's foremost advocate of intelligent design, and therefore he ought to know. As a scientist and as someone who cares about the status of science in American public life, I point to this editorial in Nature not very long ago, saying the anti-science strain pervading the right wing in the United States is the last thing our country needs in a time of economic change. And indeed, arguments about evolution lead to basically a sort of devaluation and disrespect for science across the board. And that's the last thing we need at a time when so many of the challenges confronting our country are scientific in nature. Now what I want to consider next is what the objections to evolution are and why those objections matter. And I would say it's fair to say, and I put up here some examples of anti-evolution movements around the country. You see posters like this, don't teach our kids they come from apes. And here's this really scary looking ape holding a bowie knife. And I came as a, as a biologist, that came as a surprise to me because I didn't realize that apes were armed. <laughs> The $27 million Creation Museum, which has opened in Northern Kentucky, that basically is dedicated to telling groups of school children that everything their earth science and their biology teachers are telling them in schools all a bunch of lies, um, and then critiques of the Dover case itself, one published by the Discovery Institute called Tracing into Evolution. Now, it's true that there are a lot of objections to evolution, but I'm going to consider what I consider, I'm going to talk about what I consider to be the three really big ones. One is the fossil record doesn't provide the intermediate or transitional forms that evolution requires, so there's no evolution evidence for evolution in the fossil record. The second one is DNA. The genomes of living organisms are loaded with information. Absolutely true. And then the claim is that evolutionary processes cannot create new information. Information can only come from an intelligent source like a designer. We heard a lot of this at the Dover trial. And then lastly, and this is the reason for the title of my talk, evolution is inherently anti-religious, it's an assault on faith, and therefore teaching it is a violation of religious freedom. So let's go back to the fossil record and take that first one first. This is the intelligent design textbook, which was purchased to classroom sets for students at Dover Area High School. And it makes the claim that there are indeed no transitional forms in the fossil record. So to make that claim, it picks up the evolution of the very first tetrapods. These are land vertebrates with four legs. And it shows here Ichthyostega, which is an early amphibian, and Eustenopteron, which is a lobe fin fish. These both lived in the Devonian period. That's about 360 million years ago. Um, and Ichthyostega is considered an early amphibian. And what this book tells students is look at the bone structure of the lobe fin fish, look at the bone structure in the front limb of Ichthyostega. Evolutionists are so stupid that they actually believe that somehow this magically changed into that. And what this book, written for 14-year-olds, tells students is how many different transitional species were required to bridge this gap? We don't know. But we do know that no such transitional species have ever been recovered. Now, even at the time this book was written, that statement was patently false. Let me show you what I mean. What they were telling students 
is that on the evolutionary fossil line from fish to land vertebrates, you have a low fin fish like Eustenopteron, and then you have an early amphibian, a very fishy looking amphibian like Ichthyostega, but an unbridgeable gap exists between them. And as I mentioned, what was going on? Well, what was going on is that we understood in science that these two species are part of a very well understood transitional series, and in fact, pandas explicitly ignored both Pandorichthys and Acanthostega, which are two other intermediate forms that connect those. So that rather than being an unbridgeable gap, this is actually part of a very well understood evolutionary transition in which we had a whole lot of intermediate or transitional forms. But what I'd like to do today is to go a little bit further. Let's take these two species and see if we can find an intermediate between them. Now what you have over here is a low fin fish called pander ichthys. But pander ichthys had front limbs that were so well developed in a bone structure that it could actually lift itself out of the water, much the way a mud skipper does today. A canthostega was an early amphibian, but if you're close enough, and I apologize for the small size of the screen, you can see that a canthostega has a fish-like tail, it has a fish-like head, and it has internal gills, something that no living amphibian has today, but something that all fish do. It was the most fish-like amphibian ever found. But what I want to do is say, can we find yet another transitional form exactly here at the fish to amphibian transition? I'm going to show you a clip featuring a scientist who led an expedition to find exactly such a form. In 1999, paleontologist Neil Schubert and his colleagues set out to find just such a creature. What evolution enables us to do is to make specific predictions about what we should find in the fossil record. The prediction in this case is clear cut. That is, if we go to rocks of the right age and rocks of the right type, we should find transitions between two great forms of life, between fish and amphibia. Armed with this prediction, Schubin and his colleagues organized an expedition to one of the most desolate places on Earth, the Canadian Arctic, about 500 miles from the North Pole, where rocks of just the right age are exposed. Money was running out. This is it. We were told this is our last year up there. And then in 2004, on the third day of the season, a colleague of mine was removing rock and discovered a little snap sticking out the side of the cliff, just like exactly like this. And he removed more rock and more rock and more rock, and it became clear this was a snout of a flat-headed animal. And that's when we knew flat-headed animal, 375 million years old. This is going to be something interesting. They called it Tiktaalik, which means large freshwater fish in the language of the local Inuit people. <laughs> and it's one of the most vivid transitional fossils ever discovered, showing how land animals evolved from primitive fish. Over here you have a, a fish about 380 million years old. And we see some any good fish which has the scales on its back and fins. You compare that to an amphibian, you find a creature uh, that doesn't have scales, and it's modified the fins to become limbs, the arms and legs, and a head crater, and it has a flat head with the eyes on top and the neck. What we see when we look at the fossil record at rocks of just the right age is a creature like Tiktaalik. Just like a fish, it has scales on its back and fins. You can see the fin webbing here. Again, when we look at the head, we see something very different. You see a very amphibian-like thing with a flat head with eyes on top. It gets even better when we take the fin apart when we look inside the fin, as in this cast here, what you'll see is bones that compare to our shoulder, elbow, even parts of the wrist, bone for bone. So you have a fish at just the right time in the history of life that has characteristics of amphibians and primitive fit. In other words, you have a transitional form that's so good that it's almost as though you drew it up on a drafting board. And at the same time that Neil and his colleagues were finding this fossil, another expedition found yet another intermediate form in exactly the same transition. This one is called Goganathus. It's more on the fishy side. You can see that in the skull structure. But look at its front limb. It has a humerus, a radius, an ulna, and bones that correspond to the wrist bone that we see in tetrapods today. So it's extraordinary to see the development of all of this in a primitive fish in this evolutionary line. So we started out, and this was during the Dover trial, with a pretty good understanding of the evolution of the tetrapod limb,
But during the trial itself, we never got to bring these in because these were new discoveries, Tiktaalik fits in beautifully right there, and Goganathis fits in right there. I have a former student named Colin Purrington, who's at Swarthmore College. Um, after I testified in the trial, uh, Colin called me up and said, can I read your testimony, all seven and a half hours of it? It was very interesting, and you did a good job, but you're much too verbose. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, well, if I had gotten on the stands, I would have confined my testimony to one sentence. What's the sentence? He said, I'm not going to tell you now, but it's so simple that I can put it on a bumper sticker, and I'll mail it to you. So two days later, I get an envelope, and you know what? There's a bumper sticker inside from Colin. Here's what Colin said I should have said on the stand. We have the fossils we need. <laughs> a little bit over the top, but very much right to the point. And you might wonder, why do people argue so passionately about the evolution of the first tetrapod in the Devonian period? Well, it's not because anybody really cares about amphibians. There is another reason. And it's a reason for arguing against any transitional or intermediate form in the fossil record, and that is to deny even the possibility that there might be intermediates between our species and others. And this is a photograph of a billboard that I saw in Kansas during one of the State Board of Education campaigns there. And you can see this thing, are they making a monkey out of you? Well, how about that? Do we have a human fossil record? The answer is yes. We have a human or a pre-human fossil record that is already rich and gets literally richer every couple of years where more and more pre-human ancestors are found. And interestingly, they are found in exactly the place where 150 years ago, Charles Darwin took a wild step and predicted they would be found. And that is the continent of Africa. And he based that guess on the fact that our closest biological relatives, the chimpanzee and the gorilla, are also African species. He argued, therefore, that's probably where we emerged as a species as well. And if you simply take any textbook, this is not ours, any textbook at all, and you look at the various fossil species that have been defined, over time what you discover is that there's not one or two or three missing links, but there's a series of links which is now so detailed that it shows in great detail, almost confusing detail, that we were preceded on this planet by a whole series of intermediates between ourselves and other primates. In fact, the hard part here is not finding the missing link, but it's trying to decide which one is our direct ancestor, which one is our cousin, which one is our crazy uncle up in the closet, and trying to figure out which ones are our ancestors and which ones are simply our relatives. Now, a friend of mine who worked very hard at the Dover trial, Nick Matsky, took the data from all the fossil skulls that had ever been discovered. These were summarized in a paper here in which cranial measurements were made of all of these. And Nick had the brilliant, obvious, but brilliant idea to take every single individual specimen, every dot up here is a specimen, and plot it out on an Excel spreadsheet. And they are plotted in terms of cranial capacity versus millions of years before present. And what you see down here are our Australopithecine, Australopithecine ancestors, up here modern humans, humans, and then here all of the other pre-human species color-coded between them. And what you see on this, I think, makes a powerful impression. Is there a gap between humans and non-human primates? And the answer is no. What we see is an evolutionary transition as smooth and as carefully documented as any other transition in the fossil record. Now, I find this kind of data impressive, but I'm not a fossil guy. And fossils, quite frankly, don't turn me on that much. But I am an RNA DNA guy. And one of the things that I wanted to mention is that the best evidence for evolution having acted to produce our species I don't think it comes from the fossil record, although that evidence is close to airtight. It comes from our own genome. And I'll give you an example of that. Um, here, for example, is the cover, the cover of an issue of Nature that came out right at the time that trial started. And the cover story concerned the publication of the chimpanzee genome. And it noted that more than a century ago, Darwin and Huxley proposed that we share recent common ancestors with the African great apes. They then wrote, modern molecular studies have spectacularly confirmed this prediction. And indeed, they have. But I want to show you what the nature of that confirmation is. And I want to start out with an odd example because I find it so compelling. You study embryology in college, and I did. One of the things you learn is that the embryos of placental mammals like us produce a yolk sac. Here is an uh, a, a, a endoscopic 
uh, photomicrograph of a human embryo, and this is the yolk sac right here. Here's a diagram from Gray's Anatomy. The little area here, this is the embryo. This is the disc that actually becomes a human being. Then there's a, a whole bunch of extra embryonic membranes, and the yolk sac is right here. Now, why is that significant? Well, we call it a yolk sac because when we look at uh, reptiles and birds and stuff, the yolk sac is actually filled with yolk. But in placental mammals, you know what's in there? Nothing. It's empty. We form a sac that encloses literally nothing. Why do placental mammals form a yolk sac if there's no yolk to go into the sac? Well, the straightforward explanation, and I heard this from embryology when I was in college as well, it's pretty simple. We mammals evolved from animals that did produce yolk-containing eggs, and when we switched over to the placental style of life, you can't completely redesign the way an embryo goes, so we still form the yolk sac even if it doesn't enclose yolk. Well, that's the morphological explanation from the 60s when I went to college. Uh, what does genetics and genomics tell us about this? Here's the insight, now that we can look at the DNA of our species. If the ancestors of mammals once had yolk, it must mean that the mammalian genome once had genes that would code for the protein that goes into yolk, and that protein is called vitellogen. Is there a possibility that somewhere in our genome, even though we don't make yolk in our eggs anymore, we could have remnants of the vitellogenin gene? That would be a prediction of evolutionary common ancestry, not just for us, but for all mammals. Well, lo and behold, we do. The human genome actually contains three vitellogenin genes. None of them are functional. But they're clearly there, and they share sequence homology with animals that do produce yolk-containing eggs, like birds and reptiles. Humans retain three non-functional vitellogenin remnants of all the genes that are found in birth. They're called VIT1, VIT2, and VIT3. Now, here's also what's interesting about them. Many of you may know that there are mammals that lay eggs, the spiny anteater and the platypus. Um, these are known as monotreme mammals. And it turns out, and this is the significant thing, that you can actually date the time in evolutionary ancestry when these three vitellogenin genes died. VIT1 and VIT3 were lost first. Those are still, VIT2 vit was lost about 70 million years ago. Monotremes retrain one of them, and the two non-functional remnants are there. Now, by looking at the DNA sequencing and counting up the errors, that have accumulated and these genes don't work any, that don't work anymore, you can estimate how long ago the genes were switched off. It turns out to be at exactly the same time that a new gene appeared in the mammalian genome, whose age we can also estimate, and that is the gene for casein. What is casein? It's the protein in milk. So the molecular story coincides with the loss of yolk and the acquisition of milk to feed your young two events that are combined in the evolution of placental mammals. It makes an extraordinary story. But interestingly, think about the fact that our genes, our, our genomes, contain remnants of genes that once made egg yolk, even though we don't activate them anymore. The late Stephen Jay Gould called this kind of thing a senseless sign of history. And what Steve wrote was that if organisms have a history, the ancestral stages should leave remnants behind remnants of the past that don't make sense in present terms. The useless, the odd, the peculiar, the incongruous are signs of history. Our vitellogenin genes are exactly that. They supply proof that the world was not made in its present form when history perfects, it covers its own tracks. Our genome is not perfect. We have these remnants that tell us about our own evolutionary history as organisms. Here's another. And this one I actually used in the Dover trial. We humans have 46 chromosomes. We believe on a variety of lines of evidence that we share common ancestry with all of the other great apes, gorillas, chimpanzees, orangutans. But curiously, all the other great apes, without exception, have 48 chromosomes. Now, the biologists in the room know that our 46 chromosomes are actually two sets of 23. We each got 23 from mom and 23 from dad. But a baby chip or gorilla or orang gets 24 from them and 24 from dad. Now, if we share common ancestry with these guys, how did we happen to lose a pair of chromosomes? Maybe in our evolutionary history this kind of got trashed? Well, the answer is no, that's not possible. The loss of both members of what biologists call a homologous pair of chromosomes would be fatal. You wouldn't even be able to get through embryonic development. 
So there's only one possibility that is consistent with evolutionary common ancestry, and that is two chromosomes that are still separate in the other primates got accidentally fused together to form a single chromosome in us. And that would drop us from 24 pairs down to 23. So that, in a sense, is the evolutionary explanation. But here's why evolution is science and not just conjecture. That's a testable explanation. If that really happened, then in our genome, we must carry, you and me, a recently fused chromosome. If we can't find that, then evolution by common ancestry is in big trouble. But if we can find it, it amounts to the specific fulfillment of a very specific, specific prediction from evolution. How would you figure that out? Well, what I've done here is I've sketched two chromosomes. The tips of every chromosome, shown in blue, have a highly repetitive DNA sequence that's easily recognized, called a telomere sequence. Near the center of every chromosome, there's an equally special region known as the centromere. I put that up here in red. If one of our chromosomes was formed by the recent fusion of two chromosomes that used to be separate, you know what it would look like? It would have telomere sequences where they don't belong in the center of the chromosome at the fusion site, and it would also have two centromeres, which would be most unusual for a mammalian chromosome. Do we have a chromosome like that? I'll save you the suspense. The answer is we do. It's human chromosome number two. And human chromosome number two has every mark I have just told you about. It has telomere DNA sequences in the center. It has two centromeres, which actually correspond to primate centromeres 12 and 13. And in gorillas, chimpanzees, and orangutans, we no longer call these two chromosomes in these species number 12 and number 13. We call them 2A and 2B because they correspond almost exactly to the two halves of human chromosome number two, same order of genes, and we can literally see the fusion site. Um, what would a paleontologist say about this? Darwin didn't even know about molecular biology and DNA, and that's where some of the most profound evidence is, is being uncovered today. Think about that. That somebody in the 1800s made predictions that are being confirmed in molecular biology labs today. That's a very profound statement, a very successful theory. So what Neil so they'll said there, a very powerful statement, a profound statement about a very successful theory. The correspondence of molecular biology with what we know about evolutionary common ancestry. So that's point one. Let's go to point two. Let's talk about information. And again, the claim is that evolutionary processes cannot create new information. Information only comes from other information or from an intelligent source like a designer. And we can take that claim and we can ask the following question. Does the actual research literature support that claim? And the answer to that is very clear. And the answer is no, it doesn't. And I want to explain to you what I mean by that. This is an old paper, nine years old, from Nature Reviews Genetics, Origin of New Genes, Glimpses from the Young and the Old. And what the researchers in this paper summarized were a whole series of mechanisms by which new genes with novel capabilities arise. And they actually broke them down into six categories they explained the genetic mechanisms for each of these. Is this entirely hypothetical? Absolutely not. In outlining these mechanisms, they gave specific examples, usually multiple examples, of genes that had arisen this way with references to the original research. Now, I'll give you some other examples of this. Um, here's an extraordinary study by Shelley Copley at the University of Colorado. She's discovered that evolutionary mechanisms can produce an entirely new biochemical pathway in a matter of years. And her title of her uh, paper is Evolution of the Metabolic Pathway for the Degradation of Toxic Xenobiotic. You know, one of those uh, titles that doesn't really excite. <laughs> what this is, is the evolution of a novel pathway that breaks down pentachlorophenol. Why is that significant? PCP is an entirely new compound that was first synthesized in 1935. That's the only time, that's the time when it began to appear in the environment. And guess what has happened? In about 65 years, an entirely new chemical pathway, outlined here by Copley, has evolved to break down this chemical. It's clearly the product not of design, uh, unless the designer wishes to uh, subvert our own uh, pesticides, but rather it's a way to break this down in the environment, and it shows how quickly evolution can act to assemble new chemical pathways. Here's an even more compelling example. Uh, this is a fish known as the Antarctic eel pal, 
It lives in the Antarctic Sea, where the temperature of the water is actually below the level at which blood would freeze. Why doesn't its blood freeze solid? Well, the answer is the Antarctic Ocean used to be warm. Antarctica used to be attached to South America and was pretty warm. There's lots of fossils on Antarctica, as it turns out. But about five million years ago, the continent moved, continental drift, the Antarctic Ocean began to freeze over. The fish that still swim in the Antarctic Ocean have something remarkable. They have antifreeze proteins in their blood, sort of the protein equivalent of ethylene glycol that prevents their blood from freezing. Where did these proteins come from? Because the cold level in this ocean is relatively recent. Well, it turns out in an age of DNA sequencing, we know where they came from. Antifreeze proteins evolved in these and other fishes, first by the duplication of an existing gene, and then the acquisition of new functions by that gene. And because we can look at this fish and it's not Antarctic relatives, we can actually show step by step exactly how this new gene with a novel function evolved by very well understood genetic mechanisms. And this is not the only one. Here's one of the most remarkable evolutionary experiments that's been going on for the past several decades. This is the work of Richard Lenski at Michigan State. And what Richard has done is simply to grow the common bacterium E. coli in cultures which are then serially progressed over time. No outside influence, he just allows them to grow. And he then sees, does any evolution take place without outside influence? And the answer turns out to be yes. After 20,000 generations, he saw many evolutionary changes, but the most remarkable one happened a couple years ago. Several of his colonies made, as you can see, a major evolutionary shift in the lab. What was that shift? They acquire the ability to metabolize citric, citric acid. Why is that a big deal? Well, the very definition of the bacterium E. coli, something I learned when I learned bacteriology, is E. coli will not grow on a medium containing citrate because they can't metabolize it. So if you have a bacterium, you're not sure if it's E. coli or not, plate it out on a citrate plate. If it grows, it's not E. coli. If it is E. coli, it can't grow with citrate, can't metabolize it. Lo and behold, these bacteria have now acquired the ability to metabolize citrate, a major evolutionary change. Now, remember I started talking about information. Where did these E. coli get the information on citrate? How do they learn to metabolize? Well, the answer is actually pretty straightforward. By natural selection in their culture environment, which has always contained a small amount of citrate. So the opportunity was always there. It took the bacteria 20,000 generations, but they figured out how to do it. As a general principle, evolution would say that living organisms harvest information from the environment. And in this case, the information that was harvested was the presence of citrate, and sooner or later, a series of genetic changes showed up that fortuitously enabled it to do it. These bacteria then prospered by the well-known mechanism of natural selection. Now, here's one of the key things, and this is a point of contention, and always has been in this debate. Must information, as we understand it, always come from an intelligent source? Lenski would argue, no. These bacteria didn't know anything. I didn't do any genetic engineering on them. I just let them grow. And they developed this information and this novel metabolism all on their own. But the claim, nonetheless, is made that information must always come from an intelligent source. And again, I'm saying no to that, but I want to make an analogy that might help to make this clear. I took a snapshot of Boston Channel 7 Thursday night to see what the weather forecast would be on Friday. And here is the weather forecaster, and she's saying it's going to be really hot on Friday. Most of you here Friday? It was an accurate forecast. She nailed it. Uh, so there she is. Now, the question I want to ask is, think about the weather forecast that she made. How did she base that information? Did she just, it's going to be hot to No, 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 of course not. She's a meteorologist. She's board certified. She's very competent in this. How did she make her forecast? The answer is pretty simple. She gathered as much information as she possibly could. What kind of information? Well, first of all, she gathered temperature information. A really good weather forecaster looks at as much data as they can. She also gathered information about where other weather systems were in the United States, and she also studied precipitation trends. And from all of this information, she concocted a forecast. Where did that information come from? Was there an intelligent agent 
that was setting up the temperatures, the wind patterns? So the answer is, of course not. That information was out there in nature to be gathered. Here's some of it, here's some of it, here's some more. Weather information, the kind that a forecaster use, is, uses, is produced in nature simply by interactions of matter and energy. And I shouldn't use the word simply because our atmosphere is enormously complicated. But what this tells us is that the natural processes in nature can produce information on which we hope our weather forecast, forecasters base their predictions. That's weather. How about biological information? Biological information, the same way, is also produced in nature by interactions of matter and energy. And in the case of those bacteria, in the case of the fish that I talked about in Antarctica, same thing. They reacted and harvested information in the environment. Now, this is probably going to go against some of the things that Professor Dembski will tell us in a little bit, which is one of the reasons I was very excited to be here today, because I thought productive discussions would ensue. But I want to show a point from Dr. Dembski's blog that I agree with wholeheartedly. And not very long ago, on his blog, he put up this beautiful picture of an atmospheric phenomenon called a fire rainbow. Now, I, don't know if I have never seen one. I guess I've been unlucky in the eastern United States. But when I was in grad school in Colorado, I saw these all the time. And they're a high atmospheric phenomenon caused by the refraction and reflection of ice crystals in the upper atmosphere. And in wispy clouds, you actually get to see all the colors of the rainbow right in the clouds. It's extraordinary. It's really, really beautiful. Dr. Dembski remarked on the beauty of this. And as I say, I wholeheartedly agree. These things are like, I remember sitting in the foothills in Boulder and watching these things. And, I mean, these are religious experiences. These things are so beautiful and so unexpected. But in his blog, he wrote, the existence of such beauty leads me to rebel against materialism. And I always thought that, for all the agreement I have with Bill about how beautiful these natural phenomena are, was a strange comment. And here's what I mean. Here's some more pictures of fire rainbows. I hope if you haven't seen one of these, you get a chance to see one of these. Uh, in high altitude areas, they're more common than in low altitude. But they're just extraordinary. But a fire rainbow is, in fact, 100% the result of materialism. Isaac Newton worked this out, folks. It's not rocket science. And as it turns out, this is a wholly material phenomenon. It's created by interactions of matter and energy, and it's driven by the laws of physics and chemistry. We don't have to postulate a designer to get all of this into the right place. This happens because of the properties of matter. Now, why do I find this significant? I find it significant because these are the same forces that drive evolution and produce much of the beauty we see in nature. So I'm tempted to go to Ignatius Loyola and think about some of the lessons that he gave us. And this is where the title of my talk today comes from. One of the Ignatian postulates is that we should find God in all things. This is, in effect, a motto of the, the Jesuits have many mottos, but this is one of them, to find God in all things. And I would argue, and I think Bill would agree with me on this, that God is surely present in the beauty that we see in a phenomenon like the fire rainbow. It's just an extraordinary thing to see. But let's continue on that point. What does this actually mean? Um, one of my favorite poets, someone who was, uh, when I was in college, besides majoring in biology, no kidding, I actually thought I wanted to be a poet. And I took courses in verse writing, and one of the poets I tried to imitate was Gerard Manley Hopkins. And those of you who know Hopkins know the religious characters of his poems. And he wrote, Christ plays in 10,000 places, lovely in limbs and lovely in eyes not his. I love that. The single writer who has been the most influential in my own spiritual life, I can say without qualification, was Thomas Merton. And Merton once wrote that the gate of heaven is everywhere. Heaven is not something we have to look for in a remote way. It is something we should find in the world around us. And I completely agree. Now, the concern that people have about evolution is that it's a chance, random process, and it proves that you and I are nothing but mistakes of nature. How appalling to think of everything associated with the human species as a mistake. But I think the reality, and I say this as a scientist, is that life really is material. The capacity for life is literally built into the physics and chemistry of matter. And we see that in everything we do in cellular and molecular biology. Having said that, 
That means evolution is actually an inherent and predictable property of nature. It's not a mistake. People sometimes say that our species emerged out of the natural world. I would disagree. Our species emerged with the natural world because we are part of it. If the ultimate cause of the natural world, which I certainly believe, is the will of God, then it certainly means that evolution reflects his creative power in beautiful and extravagant ways. And there are many ways to talk about this, and I really think that we should expect to find God in all things, including in the process of evolution. What I wrote in a book that I published some time ago called Finding Darwin's God is this. A God who presides over an evolutionary process is not a passive observer. Rather, he is one whose genius fashioned a fruitful world in which the process of continuing creation is woven into the fabric of matter itself. That God retains his freedom to act, to reveal himself to his creatures, to inspire and to teach. He is the master of chance and time, whose actions, both powerful and subtle, respect the independence of his creation and give human beings the genuine freedom to accept or reject his love. When I speak to religious audiences, I am sometimes criticized for being too much of a materialist. My answer to that is straightforward. I would argue that a material science that is devoted to the study of nature is not hostile to religious faith, and neither should faith be hostile to this sort of science. And as a summary of my point of view on this, um, I will basically cite C.S. Lewis, God likes matter, he invented it. <laughs> I think that's a very good way to put that, and I think we should see materialism as the handiwork of the creator. Um, to take an atheist point of view that actually is remarkably like C.S. Lewis's, I go to my favorite astronomer of all time, Carl Sagan. And Carl Sagan said, we are a way for the cosmos to know itself. He wasn't thinking in religious terms. But remember what John Hawk said last night about we are God's creation becoming conscious. That's exactly what Carl Sagan said. And that represents, I think, a robust scientific, uh, scientific conclusion that supports the theistic view of the world around us. Now, am I the only biologist who thinks this way? The answer is, of course not. This is Theodosius Dobzhansky. Jack quoted him last night. Biologists will agree he was the greatest evolutionary geneticist of the 20th century, responsible as much as anybody else for the modern synthesis of evolution. He wrote an article in the 70s, and Jack quoted the title last night, nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. That's absolutely true. If you go to Notre Dame University and you look at their beautiful new life science hall, as you walk into this beautiful building on the floor, you will see that quotation. Nothing in biology makes sense, except in the light of evolution. Remember, that's Notre Dame. Well, a lot of people know the title of this article, but I'm always amazed at how few of my scientific colleagues have read it. Here's why. If you read it, you'll come across this passage. The diversity of life is reasonable and understandable. If the creator made the living world, not by caprice, I would say not by design, but by evolution propelled by natural selection. Then he went further and he said, it's wrong to hold creation and evolution as mutually exclusive. I, Dobzhansky, am a creationist and an evolutionist. Dobzhansky was a Christian, this great evolutionary geneticist. And he went on and said, evolution is God's or nature's method of creation. Creation is not an event that happened in 4004 BC. It is a process that began some 10 billion years ago and is still underway today. And I couldn't agree more. For those of you who want a higher authority on the religious side, I would point to Pope Benedict. In 2007, a group of Italian journalists asked him about evolution, and he said the notion of a conflict between the idea of divine creation and evolution is absurd. And here's the exact quote. The contrast between evolution and creation is an absurdity, because there are many scientific tests in favor of evolution, which appears as a reality that we must see and enriches our understanding of life and being. Now, I don't know about you, but I always find that high clerics within the church tend to talk in a kind of pope-speak 
that I sometimes have difficulty translating. So if you have problems with that, I recommend you do what I always do. Go to that publication that clears everything up in a single sentence. You know what I'm talking about. It's the New York Post. Evolution and God do this. <laughs> I guess I should have just showed that slide and looked at that. Um, well, let me tell you something, though. This is very much in the Christian tradition. Augustine once wrote, the universe was brought into being in a less than fully formed state, but was gifted to transform itself from unformed matter into a truly marvelous array of structure and life forms. And that's exactly what I said, what, what I meant when I said that life is an inherent property of matter, I'm sure Augustine would have high-fived me on that one. Now, every now and then, so we'll go back to that. Every now and then, I show this slide in front of scientific audiences. And because I'm defending evolution, they usually like me right up to the point where I talk about Augustine or Kodasaw, and I get a little nervous. And once in a talk several years ago, I was asked by a geneticist, what kind of science would we get? if we follow the precepts of some weird mystic who wrote at the beginning of the 5th century. And I knew he was a geneticist, and I thought, boy, is this an easy one to hit out of the park. And I said, I'm going to answer it this way. Um, I'm going to answer it with a personal example. This is a very religious person who went into a religious order founded according to the precepts of Augustine. He was thought so highly of by his fellow priests that he was elected the abbot of the Augustinian monastery of St. Thomas in Brunn in what is today the Czech Republic. Now, at one point in his life, this very religious man got interested in a question that you and I would identify as a scientific question. That is, how do plants pass their characteristics along from one generation to another? Now, how did he answer the question? Did he read scripture? Of course, he read it every day for the Roman office. Did he pray? Of course he did. He, in fact, led his monastery in prayer. But when time came to answer a scientific question, you know what he did? He went into the garden and he did experiments. The name of that Augustinian priest was Father Gregor Mendel, the founder of the modern science of genetics. So what I told my friend was the kind of science you get when you follow Augustinian precepts is genetics. And I think that's a very, I think that is a very profound statement about the ultimate compatibility of science and faith. And I have to tell you, in the aftermath of the Dover trial, one of the people I thought who nailed the take-home lesson was Charles Krauthammer. I don't know how many of you follow Krauthammer. He's probably the most conservative columnist writing for the Washington Post. And when George Will writes for the same newspaper, saying you're more conservative is really a very proud post. But after the Dover trial, look at the column he wrote. Phony theory, false conflict. Intelligent design foolish pits evolution against faith. And what Krauthammer wrote is how ridiculous to make evolution the enemy of God. What could be more elegant, more simple, more brilliant, more economical, more creative, indeed more divine, than a planet with millions of life forms distinct and yet interactive, all ultimately derived from accumulated variations in single double-stranded molecule, pliable and fecund enough to give us mollusks and mice Newton and Einstein, even if it also gave us the Kansas Board of Education. <laughs> but I think ultimately, the way that I would sum up my own understanding of evolution is straightforward. And that is I would use the words that were written way more than a century ago by the person who at one point in his life kept this page in his notebook. And I don't know how many of you have ever seen this page before. I get to see this with my own eyes and touch this book with my own hands about four years ago, and I was literally shaking when I did. And on this page in the notebook, 1837, by the way, he wrote, I think, and then he drew a kind of tree that no one had ever seen or imagined before. And then in his very, very bad handwriting here, he explained it. And then he realized a couple weeks later, he had to take more notes. He went back and added more notes here. It's very rare in the history of science you can look at a single page in somebody's notebook and say right there, is one of the great scientific discoveries of all times. As a biologist, I'd say it's the greatest scientific discovery of all time. And as if being asked, do you find evolution degrading or demeaning or demoralizing? His answer would have been, no. I find grandeur in this view of life, with its several powers having been originally breathed into a few forms or into one, 
and that while this planet has gone cycling on according to the fixed law of gravity from so simple a beginning, endless forms, most wonderful and most beautiful, have been and are being evolved. That's the concluding sentence, last sentence, of The Origin of Species by Charles Darwin. I think those are words to live by. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. As a molecular cell biologist, could you shed some light on my two questions? What's your proposal for the process of the first genome and first cell emerge from inorganic material? And what's your explanation for the process by which human consciousness arises from little gray cells? Okay, so let me take this. Let me take the second one first, because because I, I think I can answer that more quickly. Um, first of all. The short answer to both your questions is, I don't know and neither does anybody else, okay? But let me take the consciousness question. One of the things that nervous systems of all animals do is they contain a representation of reality. Now, if, for example, you're a little planarian, your representation of reality, as far as we can tell, is simply which areas are light and which areas are dark. But as cephalization, the increase in the size of the brain occurs, the pictures of reality that organisms have evolved have become more and more sophisticated. The most striking thing in the evolution of the human species, this is just astonishing, is that in the space of less than three million years, a single organ tripled in size. And when I talk to audiences of young men, I always say, no, it's not that one before. Um, and that, that single organ is the brain. And as Stephen Jay Gould pointed out, what are all those extra neurons doing? Well, what they're clearly doing is giving us a greatly enhanced picture of reality. Now, the human brain, which is the most complicated little bit of matter in the entire universe, has as yet not succeeded in figuring itself out. However, I have yet to see a single piece of evidence that leads me to believe that what goes on up there is not ultimately explicable in terms of the laws of physics and chemistry and the cell biology of neural connections in the brain. So is it possible that there's something going on there that is entirely non-material? Sure. But is there evidence for it? And the answer is, I don't think so. So I can't explain consciousness, neither can anybody else. On the day that I do, I'm claiming at least two Nobel Prizes, because I think <laughs> that's what it's worth. Now let's talk about the origin of life, OK? Um, once again, the answer is nobody really knows. But that's not the same as saying we know nothing. Because here's what we do know. We do know that under conditions that pre prevail, not just on the primitive Earth, but under our solar system, very simple assemblies of ordinary atoms can come together to form complex molecules that are, in fact, the building blocks of life. Now, how do we know that? Well, we know that, first of all, from laboratory experiments that were begun in the 1950s by a scientist named Stanley Miller, no relation, um, and then repeated over and over again every time our understanding of the Earth's primitive atmosphere changed. And in the most recent experiments where we have the best simulations we have, those molecules still appear. Now you notice I also said in the solar system, and here's the reason. When NASA and the European Space Agency gather material from meteorites and from comets, lo and behold, they've got amino acids on them. They've got the building blocks of nucleotides. So it's very clear these molecules can come together. Next thing, are there molecules, not cells, that can self-replicate? And the answer to that turns out to be yes. Ribonucleic acid, which is built up from those building blocks, is capable not only of catalyzing chemical reactions, but even of catalyzing its own duplication. Once you have any process, it doesn't have to be a cell, once you have any process that can make copies of itself, you have all the conditions fulfilled for evolution by natural selection. And I think that's what most of the people who work on the origin of life on Earth focus in on. Now, can I give you a step-by-step -step scenario for the origin of the first living cell by means of Darwinian or biochemical processes? The answer is absolutely not, despite the things I just told you that we absolutely know about this. 
If you read my high school textbook, written again for 14-year-olds, Joe Levine and I have been very clear about what we don't know. And in fact, where we discuss the origin of the living cell, we begin by saying one of the great unsolved mysteries in biology is how the first living cell came about. And that's absolutely true. But when I speak to religious audiences, when I speak to fellow Christians, I always say, unsolved problem, everything I just said. But my advice to you as a fellow person of faith is don't hang your faith on the, the notion that this is a problem that science will never solve, and therefore it's the basis for faith. And the reason for that is science actually has a habit of solving questions that we thought were unsolvable. And if that's the basis of your faith, you would have to logically abandon it as soon as we figure the problem out. So clearly an unsolved problem. I think it's fair as a, as a teacher and an author to tell students what we know and to point to what we don't know as, as well. And that's what I try to do when I teach and when I write. Thanks for a very good question. Like there is not really a right, as a courtesy to everyone in the room, okay. say it into the microphone so they can hear. Seems like it's not really a conflict between uh, intelligent design and evolution. Well, if, if there's not a conflict between intelligent design and evolution, then we wasted seven weeks in Dover. <laughs> um, the Discovery Institute, of which Dr. Dembski is a fellow, has spent millions of dollars on a non-controversy. And I spend a lot of time defending someone who actually uh, agrees with me. But there is a fundamental conflict. And I didn't show a slide like this. But in some audiences, when I define intelligent design, I say, if intelligent design were the philosophical concept that there is meaning and purpose and order and even intelligence in the universe, and that our lives have meaning and purpose and value, I would be an advocate of intelligent design. But intelligent design, as the term is used today in the United States and other countries, is the argument that evolution itself cannot produce new genes, cannot produce complex structures, that the fossil record is woefully incomplete, that we do not share common ancestry with other organisms, and we were produced by the direct action of intelligence. And, and let me take the fire rainbow as an example of what I mean. When, uh, when I see beauty like that in nature, as I say, it's a religious experience. I, I'll tell you the most astonishing natural religious experience ever happened to me. My wife and I are shopping for really cheap stuff. This is when we were in grad school, because boy, we had no money. So we're at the Kmart on 28th Street, Boulder, Colorado. Uh, a thunderstorm, just like yesterday, had just whipped through in the west at elevation and much more dramatic. It had moved off to the east. The sun was setting at the west. We walked out of the Kmart, and in front of me, Horizon to horizon was a perfect double rainbow. Unbelievable, with the, the colors inverted on the second rainbow. And everyone was there saying, why is it called? And I was there saying, I, I know this, I know this. <laughs> the second rainbow comes from an extra refraction event, and it flips the colors. So I was there giving a lecture on basic physics. It was extraordinary. Now, is it possible to say, that such beauty in the world reflects the wisdom and the intelligence of a, 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 of a creator, of a designer. The answer is yes, and I believe that. But if by intelligent design you meant that rainbow couldn't come about through natural processes and God had to get down there and tinker with it, I'm not buying that at all. So I think that's where the conflict is. I hate to cut this short, but we're running out of oh, time. Sorry. Ken, thank you for a magnificent talk.